Good morning, Cornerstone. Good morning. It's great to see you all, and um, we are so privileged to be able to worship together. It's, um, um, our holy God, our righteous God, our God who reigns. Let's stand and sing. You paint the night. You count the stars and you call them by name. The skies proclaim, God, you reign. Your glory shines. You teach the sun when to bring a new day. Creation sings, God, you reign. better than that, I know. It's good to see you today, and I just want to update you, if I could, we had, uh, if you weren't aware or you couldn't make it, I just wanted to update you, if I could, about the results of our pie auction last night, and I think I need to stop calling it a pie auction, because there's so much that goes through, and Dan will help me out here as I, as I overlook something, I'm sure, but we had 
walking sticks, we had pies, cookies, tarts, soap, salsa, salsa, and jam, and popcorn. What else, Dan? What am I forgetting? I know it's something. Whoopie, whoopie pies and bread pudding. And you know the the bread pudding had bourbon sauce, and you can ask for forgiveness if you're one of those people who bought one of the <laughs> the bread puddings. And I wanted one, so there should be some remorse involved here. But we had a great time. And you know the bottom line is this: uh, in the end, there was twenty three hundred dollars plus raised for Bob and and Mary. And so. As I said uh, earlier, Wayne and I were discussing, uh, it's evident God's hand of blessing upon not only this past one last night, but this, the several that we've had in years past. And you know, when, when you know God behind something, we, you, you can see it when it's all over. And we're able to bless our, our missionaries with the wonderful gift. So I want to say thank you to all of those who brought items that cooked and donated and for those who came and so sacrificially gave and for those of you who couldn't make it for whatever reason boy we look forward to seeing you next year for sure so thanks again you know in the call to worship this morning i was thinking in the middle of the week what what would it be and and i started thinking about as i as i heard some words over the radio in a sermon i was thinking of life and its ups and downs, peaks and valleys, and I think that's something from the, the, the smallest child to the oldest adult we can all relate to because we experience that for sure, and David was no different. And I'm just going to take you back quickly over a kind of a timeline, and, and, I'm, and these aren't all by any stretch of the imagination, but if you think and take a look at David's life, uh, he was, there was an incredible mountaintop experience for him as a very young man when Samuel came to anoint him king over Israel, and then followed by an incredible victory over Goliath that had no business happening, but it did. Mountaintop experience for sure, but it's followed by him being pursued relentlessly by Saul and several attempts on David's life. Then we move on to David wanting to, to go to Philistia, bring back the ark. And then if you remember, something tragic happened. Uh, one of the oxen stumbled. The, the ark started to, to hit the ground, and a man named Uzziah tries to catch it, and he dies. And then the ark is returned to Jerusalem. They're dancing in the streets, David being one of them. And then he's met by his wife, Michael, who said, your behavior is appalling. David leads an Israelite army, an incredible victory over the Ammonites. Then David goes back, relaxes at home, commits adultery with Bathsheba, and there begins a downward spiral. He confesses his sin to Nathan, and his fellowship with God is restored. But then Amnon, one of David's sons, commits rape with his sister Tamar. It isn't long after, in a rage of anger, Absalom says, I'm going to overthrow my father's kingdom. He wasn't successful, but when David heard the news of victory, it was also met with a, with a valley experience when he realized that Absalom was killed. Ups and downs, peaks and valleys, joy and sorrow. I think everybody can relate to that. And when I think about that, how, as children of God, how do we do it? How do we keep our perspective and not question our faith? Not consider God a million miles away, or does God even care about me anymore? Does he love me? How do we get away from that? I think we need to remember that nothing, whether good or or bad passes, nothing happens without it passes through the fingertips of God. He's sovereign, he's in control. God rejoices with us in the mountaintop experiences and he's just as close in the valley experiences. 
You know, it's through those times of testing. God knows what he's doing. It's through those times of testing that we're refined. The tougher the test, the more refined we become. You know, we're programmed as a very blessed people. We think through every experience there, na there needs to be a happily ever after, don't we? And that's not necessarily so in this lifetime. But as children of God, we realize that there will be a happily ever after when we meet in heaven. Let's take a look at what David had to say. If you want to turn with me quickly in Psalm 13, you'll see David going through the same thing and what he had to say. In Psalm 13, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart? Daily, How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, and my enemy will say I have prevailed against him. And those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. And here comes the mountaintop. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do to each one, each person here, Lord, relate to peaks and valleys, joys and sorrows. What we do with those, Lord, we need your help. Father, help us to realize that you're in complete control, not almost all, but complete control. Father, realizing that each minute, each second of every minute of every hour of every day, you're in control. And Father, when we have those mountaintop experiences, we thank you. And Lord, as well, when we have those experiences in the valleys. Father, may we realize your presence through each. Thanking you, Father. Father, we are so grateful that you never leave us nor do you forsake us. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Though the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there is still one king reigning over all. Those are the words to um, uh, a new song that we're going to be introducing today called Ancient of Days. Let's stand and sing praise to our Ancient of Days. <laughs> Trust in 
Perfect in love, God is sovereign over us. There is strength within our sorrows. There is beauty in our tears. You meet us in the morning. The love that casts out fear. You are working in our waiting, sanctifying us. When beyond our understanding, you're teaching us to trust. Your plans are still to prosper, you have not forgotten us. You are with us in the fire and the fire. Faithful forever, perfect in love, you are sovereign over us. You are wisdom unimaginable. You understand always Raining high above the heavens Reaching down in endless grace You're a lifter of the lowly
together with John and McKenna and little Mava they'll be moving back to Indiana this coming week so I've asked John uh, if he'd come and I don't know if McKenna is coming to or not but we'd love to hear from you and just a chance to say goodbye to you this morning and uh, hear your thoughts thanks Wayne uh, so if we haven't met any of you guys I'm John Harrell, my wife McKenna Harrell, and a baby Mavis back there. Um, and just wanted to take a minute to share some of the blessings that the church uh, and the church family here has meant to us over the last few years. Um, I'll try not to get emotional. I may talk fast. But um, on Monday, the movers come. They, they pack up our house, and then we're headed back to Indianapolis, which is where our family's from mostly. Um, so they'll be packing up the house, but the memories are what uh, have grown and sustained us uh, as believers over the last last two years uh, here in Maine. And we'll always remember this church. Uh, for the first Sunday, I was welcomed and met the elders and Pastor Wayne. Uh, we will always remember this church because when we were visiting for the first time, we were looking for a house, and uh, Melissa had said, hey, what's your moving date? I'm going to put it on my phone so I make sure to remember and invite you and welcome you guys when you do move here, and we really appreciated that. We will always remember this church by the homes of the Walls, Shepherds, Dumonts, Denny's, Cortises, Blounts, Rellas, Konings, Nelsons, Bashans, and more than I'm not remembering, uh, that offered hospitality to us, and we were able to see the church in different people's living rooms and at their dining room tables. We will always remember this church for the fun and sportsmanship of the softball league. Uh, it wouldn't have been fun if we won every game, so uh, we'd be like the Patriots, and nobody likes the Patriots. So uh, it was a great way to get to know the church and the people uh, being outside. We will always remember this church, uh, the strong, in-depth discipline and study of the Bible and the Word of God. We will always remember this church for being the church that our first child was born into and kept us fed for four weeks as everyone brought us meals um, and was so hospitable. We will always remember this church for the love it showed and endurance put forth in the midst of the pandemic and continuing to meet and um, fellowship with one another. We always remember this church for being a light uh, in a city on a hill in a very unchurched state, a group of believers uh, that's dedicated disciples of Christ, aiming at producing the aroma of Christ to the community and all the people around it. So thank you guys so much. I really appreciate the, the hospitality and the welcome. I'll pray for us. <clears throat> Dear Lord, thank you um, for this church, for this community. Uh, we're not worthy to come before you, but I just I thank you for the opportunity. Um, just pray for Pastor Wayne this Sunday uh, that we'd be able to learn uh, from Second Samuel and, and grow uh, closer to you through it, Lord. I uh, just pray for uh, the church family that would be healthy and uh, that we would open our hearts and our ears to your word today. Let it change us. Let it grow us and uh, sustain us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, John and McKenna and Mava. We're going to miss you very much. And uh, I'd like to just uh, have a little prayer for them as we send them off today as well. So just let's pray again. <clears throat> God, we thank you for the blessing um, of John and McKenna these past two years and for answered prayer with the birth of this little child, beautiful Mava. Give them wisdom as they raise her in the nurture and admonition of your word. We send them off, Lord, with your blessing uh, on your lives. We would want to impart to them your grace and send them with our prayers and our loves, love and ask that um, as they join together with another local church back home, that you continue to use them and just have them to be a bright light as they have been here, uh, Lord, to others. And 
Thank you for their servant hearts and uh, the kindness and the love that they have showered upon this congregation. May you bless them for that. May your face shine upon them and be very gracious to them, Lord. We ask for safety as <clears throat> in the travels as they move and um, just for your uh, blessing in the days and the years to come upon their lives. May we continue to hear good things about them and from them. And uh, Lord, now as we turn our eyes and ears again to your holy word, we ask once again, Lord, in this service that this will not be um, persuasive words of human wisdom, but a demonstration of the spirit and of power that is in the word, inherent in it, Lord, that your spirit would take it today and apply it to our hearts in a saving and sanctifying way. May all the glory and praise be to you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> if you would turn, please, to 2 Samuel chapter 20. Uh, we didn't quite finish chapter 19 last week because the, the, from verse 40 uh, to the end is really goes with chapter 20. It would have been good if the chapter division was there. Those divisions weren't inspired, but the word is. And so we'll, we'll go back and include that in the text today. Have you ever questioned God and asked him, as David was doing in Psalm, um, what was it, Psalm 13, I think, that David Nelson was reading in the call to worship, just asking God questions about why this, why that, why are you allowing it? When, Lord, will, will you come and change the situation and the circumstances that I'm in? Have you ever done that with God when he's allowed you to go through a personal event or circumstance that was painful to you? Why do people that we love get cancer? We're, it seems like we've been praying for, uh, I can think of five different people in the past few months that I pray for regularly that, that uh, have been struck with cancer. Or have you ever questioned God about a national tragedy? Um, why this attack on the Twin Towers back in September 9th, 2001? Why tsunamis? Why earthquakes? Why are there evil dictators in the world that are doing horrendous things to people? Why do you allow that, God? When will you come? When will you change those situations? We call these mysteries of providence. And there are things that happen in life that we don't understand because we are not God. Sometimes in time, God reveals the reasons behind these events or circumstances, but other times it remains hidden to us. He has his plans, and sometimes the secret things belong to the Lord, and he doesn't always reveal them. Here in 2 Samuel chapter 20 and the end of chapter 19, David is wrestling with the, the mystery of providence as he's suddenly faced with undesirable and unexpected turn of events. Chapter 19 uh, was a fairly positive chapter for him up until the last part of it. The rebellion of Absalom has been snuffed out. David has been restored to, the, to his throne. His enemies are reconciling with him. Shemi, who cursed him, is now begging his pardon and forgiveness. Mephibosheth comes back and has proven loyal to David. The ten tribes of Israel have uh, were the first to call David back to be their king. It's a beautiful day in the sun for David, a beautiful day in the neighborhood. But it is short-lived because at the end of 2 Samuel 19, there's a fierce quarrel, quarrel that breaks out between the tribes. It seems like David is so popular now that they're fighting over him. And the northern tribes... Uh, feel that they have a greater share in David than the southern tribe of, of Judah does. Uh, they come uh, on the heels of David being escorted across the Jordan River by the tribe of Judah, and they're upset like, hey, we should have had that honor and privilege. At least you should have waited for us to bring the king across and welcome him. After all, there are ten of us, ten tribes, only one of you, 
So we have a greater part in David than you do. But the tribe of Judah is saying, hey, wait a minute. Uh, David is flesh and bone with us. He is of the tribe of Judah. He is near kin to us. We have a greater share in David than you do. And so out of the ashes of Absalom's rebellion, now there's a second uprising. Because of the spirit of, of jealousy and, and pride breeding dissension amongst the tribes. And the whole ball of yarn, the ball of peace is just unravels here. Perhaps you've had a broken bone or a family member's had a broken bone in the past. And uh, what does the doctor do? He, he, he sets the bone back so that the, the limb is straight again. And then tells you to be very careful, puts a cast on your arm or your leg. Burbanks have had many of these casts in the years gone by. And uh, the, the cast is there so that the bone can heal. It needs time to heal before it's strong again. Well, there's a broken nation here. The bone has been reset, but they're being tested, it seems, too soon, and it breaks again before it has time to heal. And the contention between the tribes here will, will cause there to be a continental divide. In chapter 20, verse 1, we read, And there happened to be there a rebel whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite. And he blew a trumpet and he said, We have no share in David, nor do we have inheritance in the son of Jesse. You see, he's taking the words of, of the tribe of Judah and he's spinning them around to his own interpretation of it, to his own advantage. He's saying, you guys are saying, we don't have a share in David. It's not what they're saying. They're saying, you don't have as big a share as we do. So if that's the way you feel about it, every man to his tents, O Israel, we will rule over ourselves. We don't need David. So every man of Israel deserted David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri, but the men of Judah from the Jordan, as far as Jerusalem, remained loyal to their king. And there's a picture here of Christ and his kingdom. If you look closely, never forget the words of, of Jesus in John 5, 39 to the Pharisees. He said, you search the scriptures because you, in them you think you have eternal life. But I tell you, they are they which testify of me. In other words, the Old Testament scriptures, Jesus is saying, are all about me. And you are missing that. You're missing the most important thing. And we don't want to miss that today. We don't want to miss that there is a king behind King David. There is King Jesus. And often through the life and, and uh, reign of David, we see pictures and parallels of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus said that in his kingdom, there would be two classes of people. There would be the wheat, and there would be the tares. There would be true possessors of Christ who have been redeemed with his precious blood, and there will be false professors who are not blood-related, who are not really part of the kingdom, who have no part in the king. And when their faith is tested, they will fall away just like the ten northern tribes here deserting David. Remember what happened on Palm Sunday. The multitudes were following Jesus down the Mount of Olives toward Jerusalem during this triumphal entry, and they were hollering and with great joy saying, Hosanna to da the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. But then... Five days later on Good Friday, many of this same multitude were screaming, crucify him, crucify him, away with him. His blood be upon us and our children. The question this morning is, are you a true possessor of Christ and not just a professor? Are you blood related? Have you been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb of God? Are you a loyal subject of King Jesus? Just when things were finally going well here for David, as the old farmers used to say, everything went haywire. Everything just becomes a tangled mess. And it happens to us all in life to, to one degree or another. And why does God allow these things? Why does life fall apart sometimes? Why these mysteries of providence 
Doesn't God care about us? Where is God when, when I'm being attacked? Or where is God when I'm being crushed by circumstances? And the answer to that is that he is in the same place that he was 2,000 years ago when his son was being crushed on a cruel cross for our sin. Where was he? He was sitting on his throne in heaven, reigning over every atom in this universe, sovereign over all. The doctrinal lesson that I want to bring out of this chapter today is God is infinitely worthy of our utmost trust when life seems grim, when life goes haywire. Why should we trust God in the dire uh, experiences of life that we don't understand why it's happening? And I'll give you three answers to that question uh, a bit later in the sermon. But first, we're going to, to read the scripture here, the chapter together. And this will be kind of like your, if you've got a John MacArthur study Bible, the study notes. I'm just going to add a few comments here and there to the scripture reading. And then we'll come uh, to answer those questions. So we've read verses 1 and 2. Verse 3, now David came to his house at Jerusalem after the northern tribes had departed and deserted him. And the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and put them in seclusion and supported them, but did not go into them. Why? Because Absalom, his son, had defiled them. As part of his rebellion, uh, in, in public view, on, on the rooftop, he went into these women that David had left behind to take care of the palace. It was his way of rebelling against his father and saying, I am the new king. I am over David and all that David possesses. So they were shut up to the day of their death, living in widowhood. And we see here how the sins of the father are visited upon the children. The, the scripture says to the third and fourth generation sometimes of those who hate me. David's sins of, of uh, polygamy, of having many wives and concubines here, if he had not had been living in that sinful state, his son Absalom would not have had opportunity to do this. But we see this also in his son Solomon to the extreme degree. David had a few wives and a few concubines. Solomon has what? I think it was 600 wives and 300 concubines. And the scripture says they turned his heart away from God and he began to follow their gods and worship their idols. It was devastating to to uh, Solomon and to his reign. And the king said to Amasa, assemble the men of Judah for me within three days and be present here yourself. He doesn't turn to Joab. Joab's been demoted because David now knows Joab is the one that executed his son Absalom, defying his orders to bring him back alive. So he's made Amasa, the former head of Absalom's army, the new, new commander-in-chief. So Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, but he delayed longer than the set time which David had pointed him. He's not able to do this as quickly as Joab because he doesn't have the contacts that Joab has as the commander for many years. He's going out now, remember, he's mustering troops from the shepherds and farmers and the people in the rural areas and the other cities. He's bringing, uh, these are not full-time soldiers, but these are men that are called to arms in times of trouble like this. It takes him longer than expected. And so David said to Abishai, Joab's brother, Now Sheba, the son of Bichri, will do us more harm than Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue him, lest he find for himself fortified cities and escape us. So Joab's men with the Cherethites and the Pelethites and all the mighty men went out after him. These are the full-time soldiers. And they went out of Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, the son of Bichri. These are David's elite forces, his royal bodyguard, a full-time soldiers, men of renown. We're going to re read in a later chapter of their great accomplishments in, in battle. And when they were at the large stone, which is in Gibeon, as they're working their way north, Amasa came before them to this appointed landmark. And this must have been where they were supposed to meet and muster the tribes. 
And now Joab dressed in battle armor, and it was on, and on it was a belt with a sword fastened in its sheath at its hips. As he was going forward, the sword fell out accidentally on purpose. He, this, this was something that he would have practiced and uh, was able to do very artfully, making it look like the sword was falling out of sheath, but it was just a, uh, an excuse, an opportunity for him to get his sword, his hand on his sword and have it unsheathed. Because here, as we read on, as he was moving toward Amasa, it fell out. And then Joab said to Amasa, with a forked tongue, Are you in health, my brother? Amasa is his cousin. Are you in health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. And Amasa thinks that cousin Joab is sincere. And he's thinking, this is a show of solidarity. He's been demoted. I'm taking his place. But he's showing before all the armies of Israel that there's no ill between us. But he couldn't have been more wrong. This was not the case. This was a Judah kiss. This was a traitor's embrace, much like what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane many years later. But unlike the Lord Jesus, who, who knew what Judas was up to, Amasa did not see what was coming next. Amasa did not notice the sword that was in Joab's hand, and he struck him with it in stomach, and his entrails poured out on the ground, and he did not strike him again. He did the same thing to another general named Abner a few chapters earlier. And thus Amasa died. And then Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued Sheba, the son of Bichri. Meanwhile, one of Joab's men stood near Amasa and said, Whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David, follow Joab. So Joab is back in charge. This was the plan all along. But Amasa wallowed in his blood. He's dying there in the middle of the highway. And when the, the man saw that all the people stood still, he moved Amasa from the highway to the field and threw a garment over him when he saw that everyone who came upon him halted. As the armies of Judah are coming forward and they're seeing Amasa lying there in the highway, wallowing in his blood, they're stopping, what, what's going on here? Why did this happen? What should we do? And so he's dragged out into a field and covered over. And the men of Judah realize they still got a job to do. If they're going to do it, they're going to have to follow Joab. Many of them uh, preferred to have him in leadership anyway doing this. And he went through all the tribes of Israel, Joab and the armies. They're heading north to Abel and Beth Maaka. This is 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. So they're searching through the tribes of, of Israel, the northern tribes, trying to find where Sheba is. And he is held up in, in this city, Beth Maaka. And all of the Burites, people from Beeroth and Benjamin, all of his uh, family members and others were gathered there also after Sheba. And then... They, jo Joab, came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Maaka, and they cast up a siege mound against the city, and it stood by the rampart, and all the people who were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. All of their machinery now is, is being built up on this huge uh, mound, this ramp they build to take them right up to the wall. They're ready to knock it down. There's been no communication between Joab and the people of the city. Joab assumes that everybody in that city is against him, and the people in the city are assuming that Job has come here to, to uh, destroy us all. Verse 16, then a wise woman cried out from the city. She's gone up on the top of the wall, and she's uh, hollering, Hear, hear, please say to Joab, Come nearby that I may speak with you. And when he had come near to her, the woman said, are you Joab? Are you the commander of the armies of, of David? And he answered, I am. And she said to him, Hear the words of your maidservant. And he answered, I'm listening. So she spoke, saying, They used to talk in former times, saying, 
they shall surely seek guidance at Abel. And so they would end disputes. She's reminding him of, of their legendary reputation for having wise people in the city that others would come to and have their disputes settled because there's a major dispute going on here and she would like it settled. I am among the peaceable and faithful in Israel. We are not rebellious against you, Joab, and you seek to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why would you swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? And she's appealing here to, to Scripture, to Deuteronomy 20, verse 10, which says, When you go near a city to fight against it, then proclaim and offer a peace to it. And if they want peace, if they are your enemies, then they, are, they, are, they pay tribute and they become subject to you. But if they do not uh, accept the offer of peace then, and open to you, then all the people who are found in it shall be placed under tribute to you. Uh, excuse me. Now, if the city will not make peace with you, but war against you, then you shall besiege it. Joab has put the cart before the horse. He's gone to besieging the city without offering peace, first of all. And Joab answered and said, Far be it, far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. You can see the wisdom of the woman here at work. And he's listening. That is not so, but a man from the mountains of Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bichri by name, has raised his hand against the king, against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. So the woman said to Joab, Watch and his head will be thrown to you over the wall. And then the woman, in her wisdom, went to all the people, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and threw it out to Joab, so that this one head would save many. And then Joab blew a trumpet, and they withdrew from the city, every man to his tent. So Joab returned to the king at Jerusalem. And what did David do with Joab for killing uh, Amasa? Next verse, and Joab was over all the army of Israel. Joab was too strong. He was too popular. And David feared him, and David knew that he did not have the, the power or the popularity to, to remove him from being the commander. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites. These were the special forces, the royal bodyguard. The interesting thing, we don't really know where these Cherethites and Pelophites are from, but uh, in devotions yesterday, I happened to read 20, Ezekiel 25, 16, which talks about the Cherethites being along the coast uh, of Israel in the land of the Philistines. So it's very likely that they are former Philistines. And when David was in exile there, they became followers of David and followers of David's guard, and they went with him when we, he returned to Israel. So there's a beautiful picture, if that's the case here, also of, of the kingdom of Christ, because we're told in Scripture that not only are the Jews the people of God, believing Jews, but also the Gentiles have been grafted in to the olive tree, so that the kingdom of God is made up of Jew and Gentile believers. And that's what we see in David's forces. A couple of uh, three or four more names mentioned. Adoram was in charge of revenue. Jehoshaphat, the son of Aki Lud, was recorder. Sheva was scribe. Zadok and Abiathar were the priests. And Ira the Jerite was a chief minister under David. These are some of his royal officials, important men. Coming back to the doctrinal lesson now, God is infinitely worthy of our utmost trust when life spirals out of control. One hour, David's kingdom is united. The king is crossing the Jordan River with great glory. Many in the tribe of Judah are there to bring him across and, and welcome him back. There's peace between all the tribes of Israel that has been restored. The king is restored to his throne. And then the next hour, this, this set bone is broken again. And there's a new rebellion. And life just goes haywire in a heartbeat. It could be a vehicle collision. It could be a biopsy report. It could be the death of a loved one. It could be 
the, the betrayal of someone you know. It could be a stab in the stomach. It could be a fickle friend turning on you. God allows bad things to happen to believers. And that is the reality that we must accept and learn to live with. Why should we trust God in, in those dire experiences that we don't understand? I want to give you three answers to that that come out of the passage here. Number one is that God has the bigger picture in view. David doesn't know what the bigger picture is at the moment this is happening, but we get to see it as it unfolds looking back at history. My wife, uh, Linda, loves to do puzzles. Usually there are at least a thousand pieces to the puzzle spread out on our dining room table. And if I were to bring five pieces, like I meant to do this morning when she wasn't looking, I meant to grab four or five and bring them because she wouldn't trust me with them. Uh, To show you those five pieces, do you think you would be able to figure out what the big picture is? No way, not at all. And the reality is that whatever our life circumstances are, we only have three or four or five pieces of the puzzle, don't we? But God has the whole puzzle. He has, he has the box. He's designed the picture, and he is in control of where and when and how each piece of that puzzle is going to fit together for the bigger, beautiful picture that he has purposed. As I've watched Linda do puzzles, usually when she's puzzling, I'm in the basement playing the banjo. That's my therapy. But sometimes when I come up for a snack and she's at the table doing the puzzles, I've never seen the pieces argue with her. They never argue with the puzzle assembler. They simply obey her, submit to her, and they become, as she puts them in place, part of the bigger, beautiful picture. Every few hours and every few days, I see more and more of that picture coming together. And remember that when things spiral out of control and when the pieces of the puzzle are are all over the table and you don't know what the big picture is, remember that God knows how to assemble them. Remember that he is in control. He is sovereign over us. And the question is, will you trust him in your circumstances? As Joseph did when Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, when he became a slave in Egypt, when he was thrown in prison on false charges, and yet he just continued to trust God. Can you trust him as Joseph did? Can you trust him as the Lord Jesus did when he was betrayed by one of his own apostles, when he was deserted by the rest of the apostles, when he was nailed to a cross, even when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Can you trust him like Jesus did? Because what a grander plan God had for Joseph and for Jesus. Joseph never knew what the bigger picture was. Jesus obviously did. But in our text here, David doesn't know. And yet we see that he will triumph. We see that the rebellion will be squashed, that Sheba will be executed, the rebel, that peace will be restored once again. And we see the bigger picture uh, for David that he learns in time. And the lesson is simply that God is faithful and he is infinitely worthy of our trust. Even when life is in its darkest darkness, even when it is totally chaotic. Remember that in our present circumstances, we only have a few pieces of the puzzle. And the assembler has them all. Can you trust him with it? Secondly, God is to be trusted by our utmost faith because he has his own wise ends for all that he allows. Even in tragic events, he has his reasons. Let me give you a couple of them. There's the law of the harvest that you reap what you sow. We see Absalom reaping what he sowed. He 
Uh, he died a humiliating death. He was swinging from a tree caught in branches by his long flowing hair that he was so proud of. And there he died in humiliation. This son of David, this prince, who was going to become the next king, so he thought, by rebellion. And God humbled him. And he died by the sword that he wanted to use against his own father. His pride, his treason... His attempt to assassinate David came to a grinding halt in a humiliating way. The sovereignty of God ordered and worked these things out. Joab was allowed to kill Amasa and Abner before that, and Absalom. Why was Joab allowed to do that? Again, if you look back at their lives and the law of the harvest, these men were reaping what they had sowed. Abner and Amasa were former uh, enemies of David's. They were commanders of armies that had become traitors against David, against God's anointed. And God used Joab, though he's not a righteous man, to bring judgment to them. But what about Joab? Doesn't it seem like he's getting away with, with murder, with evil? Well, the story's not finished, right? We haven't got to that part yet. But David's last words to his son Solomon, the new king, in 1 Kings 2, 5, are these. Moreover, you know also what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did to me, and what he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel, to Abner, the son of Ner, and to Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he killed. And he shed the blood of war in peacetime, and put the blood of war on his belt that was around his waist, and on on his sandals that were on his feet. These men had joined David. They had repented and they were part of David's army when Joab killed them. Therefore, do according to your wisdom, Solomon, and do not let his gray hair go down to the grave in peace. And Solomon executed Joab. As Joab had put the sword in others, he was killed by the sword. It's the law of the harvest. That is one of God's purposes in the bigger picture. Another one, another wise end is that God uses uh, these times of affliction to test us and to refine us. As we've heard in some of the songs we've sung this morning, we're allowed to go through the furnace of affliction. And we see that in David's life over and over and over. He's often, God has used adversity to refine David. There's Saul there's the Philistines, there's Absalom, there's Joab, there's Shemi, there's Sheba. In the next chapter, there will be a famine in the land. And God uses all of these things in David's life to refine him. So that he says in Psalm 66:10, For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined in the furnace. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You, notice who's sovereign here. You have caused men to ride over our heads. You've let bad things happen to us, Lord. We went through fire and through water, but you brought us out to rich fulfillment. God accomplished his, his purpose and his, uh, his ends in allowing or ordering these things, not only with Israel, but in our lives as well. So I would ask you, what greater good do we get from Romans 8.28, that promise of God that he works all things together for good that though, for those that love him and that are the called according to his purpose, to, to believers. What is the greater good God's talking about there? It's in verse 29, isn't it? That you would be conformed to the image of his son. God's ultimate end and all that he allows is that we would be made more like Jesus by it. Because this is to his glory and this is to our greatest good. This is the greatest good we can gain in our trials. Is that I would become as near and as like Jesus as a saved sinner can be. That is the bigger picture. The beautiful picture that God has in view. And so we, we should trust him with all our hearts because of that and because he has his own wise ends, wherefore he allows all that happens to us. He is infinitely worthy of our trust. 
And thirdly, and finally, because omniscience makes no mistakes. Sometimes um, when Linda cuts my hair, um, I'll hear the word, oops. <laughs> a few years ago, it, it, was a, it was a really big oops. <laughs> and uh, she, was, uh, she was freaking out. And I said, it's okay, honey. Whatever, whatever you did, it's going to grow back. And uh, she had forgotten to change the guard on, on the hair because on the sides it's shorter, but on top she leaves it longer. And she had forgotten to change it uh, when she did the new haircut. So the short part went right over the top. And I didn't have to comb my hair for like three weeks. It just was so short you didn't have to, to comb it anymore. It was kind of con convenient. Um, John... Piper has this maxim. He says that God never says, whoops. He never makes mistakes. My heart attack this summer was no mistake. Your crisis that you may be in or that you will be in or that you have been, be, have been in is not random. It's not accidental. God is omniscient. He knows all things eternally. He never has to learn everything because he already knows everything. Nothing happens that surprises him or takes him off guard. Nothing is out of his sovereign control because his omniscience allows or orders everything that happens. And his omnipotence, his almightiness works out everything according to his will and his plan. And we fall back on this, that, that the God we know of Scripture is not only omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent everywhere, but He is good. He is all good. He is holy, holy, holy. He is love. He is merciful. He is gracious. And we can trust that kind of a God in our darkest darkness, can't we? And He doesn't owe you or me, an explanation for whatever it is we're going through. He doesn't need our permission to allow bad things to happen. He doesn't need our instruction. He doesn't ever need to consult with Wayne Denny about what he's going to do. I listened to part of a sermon one time by a prosperity gospel preacher and he was carrying on about how God comes to him and asks his advice on what he should do in this situation or that situation. That is the epitome of foolish arrogance. God never has to consult with anyone. Never does he need counsel. That is the lesson of the book of, of Job. God did not give an answer to Job as to why he was suffering. It's the mysteries of providence. They are his to disclose in time if he chooses or they're his to keep secret if he chooses. Else we would never need faith. If we knew all the answers all the time, why God's doing this, why he's allowing that, what, what use is there for faith? And faith is one of the things that pleases God the most. Can we trust him in our difficulties, in our trials, in our crises? Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. If we really believe in this God of the Bible, this omniscient, omnipotent, all good and gracious and merciful and holy and just God, how can we not trust him? How can we ever doubt him? How can we ever question him? How can we ever criticize him for allowing things that we don't like? God is infinitely worthy of my utmost trust even when the storm clouds gather. The mysteries of providence are His alone. He has the big picture in view and He determines when all the, the little pieces of the puzzle get put together. And we may get to see the big picture and we may not. We don't, may only see part of it. But can we trust Him? He has his own wise reasons for all that he allows. And they are good reasons. And the greatest is that I would be more like Jesus through it. And his infinite knowledge and power make no mistakes. 
Therefore, if those statements are true, those three principles, then I can trust him with the utmost faith with whatever this life throws at me. Because it's not fate, it's not chance, it is God Almighty who's in control. And I'm good with that. Father, thank you that you are such a God as this, one so worthy of our trust and our love and our dedication. Lord, give us grace, we pray today, to trust you implicitly in every situation. We don't ask you to give us trials and tribulations, Lord, but when we ask you to increase our faith, we know that that may be the case. Help us to joyfully walk with you, trust you, and glorify you by being conformed more and more to the likeness of Jesus. For it's in his name we pray and ask these mercies, and for your glory and our good. Amen. Amen.